excuse me, Council, excuse me, Miami-Dade County Homeless Trust. Also Vice President of University Advancement for St. Thomas, Thomas University and um, Assistant Manager for the City of Miami Beach. Um, so with that, Paul, I'll turn it over to you so you can open this discussion up, tell us a little bit about what's going on and, and then we'll hear from Hilda. Terrific, okay, good morning. Thank you, Mark, Javon, Jerry, and the Construction and Development Council for the opportunity to present energizing our industry, building career paths for the homeless. I'm gonna provide a brief overview before turning the presentation over to Hilda. As uh, Mark mentioned, she is our current CEO of Camilla's House where she's been there for four years. Um, as a member of the Miami Beach Chamber and Board of Governors, I've listened to discussions and board meetings regarding the homeless, and in particular, the homeless youth couch surfing and the need for viable solutions. So today's presentation evolved from meetings with Mark, Javon, Aaron, Jerry, and myself, and discussions about Camilla's house, the homeless, and innovative partnership approaches to helping solve homelessness in our community. So by many accounts, uh, homelessness is not a choice. It's often a matter of unfortunate circumstances. And despite a stereotype that all homeless fall under one category, most homeless have no desire to remain on the streets, but what they do need is help. So at Camillus, we're, we're doing a lot of work in training and development. So today we'll focus a little bit and Hilda may expand a little bit on it, um, on the construction trades since that's kind of what this group is about. Uh, currently Camillus, along with the Southeast Overtown Park West CRA, we are partnering to take major steps to address homelessness through construction training. So at Camilla's clients, uh, clients are a term we use for residents of Camilla's house, basically out of respect and dignity for them. Uh, they will be participating in what we hope will be recurring 14 week construction training programs. We're also partnering with the Miami World Center for basic OSHA certification and onsite training on their construction projects. So why construction training? You know, given the high living wage, Construction training is a great pathway for individuals to be lifted up and out of homelessness and to become more independent. At the same time, it provides, as Mark mentioned, a much needed workforce for the construction industry. It also will help developers and contractors you know, comply with any economic incentive agreements requiring hiring quotas of skilled and unskilled workers uh, from targeted zip codes. And so for many of you probably know that penalties can be steep for not meeting those quotas. So it's a true win-win situation. So the pathway as we put in the headliner for homelessness is basically you're, you're on the street, the homeless trust identifies you as a, per, a person who could be taken off the street and put into residential treatment. You go to Camilla's house, you're treated and stabilized. We train you with skills. We provide job placement, permanent housing, independent living, and ultimately self-worth. So sustainability is the key. So it's a kind of a flow through system to move homeless from the street, permanent housing with a great job. That's, that's really what it's all about. At the same time, it'll free up what's called emergency beds for those still living on the streets. And emergency beds in Dade County are in extremely short supply. Uh, Hilda may elaborate on some of this, I don't know, but even pre-COVID on any given night countywide, if uh, there may be maybe 10, 10 beds available for street homeless. So we've got to, this is an opportunity for us to move people through the system, get them out, get them productive, open up the beds for additional people to move off the streets. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, when the, when some of the board meetings with the, the homeless use, so the couch surfing. So that frequent topic that comes up on the chamber. So the hope here is that by giving great jobs to individuals, heads of households, skilled in a vocational trade, earning a living wage, which is key, maybe we can provide for the family and help family units stay intact. That's the hope. So today's pr presentation is gonna consist of a brief overview of Camilla's house, its history, brand, and services. Most people know Camilla's as a name. We're gonna expand a little bit on that today. 
and then talk more about the vocational training and career placement for the homeless within the local construction community. I think we may talk a little bit about other skills training that we're doing, such as we have culinary arts training courses and how you can help. So I think before I turn it over to Hilda, just a few things I think Mark had mentioned. I don't know if you mentioned she started her career in a Miami TV station. So you make director of communications for Miami Dade, assistant city manager of Miami Beach, executive director of the Miami Homeless Trust twice, and vice president of the University of Advancement at South St. Thomas University. And of course, for the, four, the past four years, CEO of Camilla's House. I, I'm biased. Sorry, Hilda, I'm biased, but I think Hilda is the best person in Miami-Dade County to lead the way to what is going to, what's called functional zero homelessness, where basically there are no street homeless other, you know, or anybody who is on the street, there's a place for them to go. So with that, I want to turn it over to Hilda and, uh, and, and, and she's going to present to us a little bit more. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back at the chamber. It's been quite a few years since I have <laughs> been at a chamber meeting, needless to say. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Good morning, Commissioner, and certainly members of, uh, of the committee. So I just, I don't want to, you know, uh, spend a heck of a lot of time. I want to be able to answer any questions you may have. There's usually, in my experience, tons of questions <laughs> on the homeless issue. But just to give you a little bit of an overview um, on Camilla's house. And you know, most of the folks uh, know, see Camillus now, that big old building there, you should see us downtown Miami. Um, and they think of us, you know, you know, there's, there's that place that serves the homeless, homeless shelter, what have you. Well, back in 1960, you know how they always say when there's a national story of import importance, there's always a Florida angle. And uh, needless to say, there's a Florida story, there's always a Miami you know, angle. Um, and there's, whenever there's a story about our community, there's always a Cuba angle. And the truth of the matter is, is back in 1960, the Little Brothers of the Good Shepherd received a call asking them to come to Miami and open a sheltered soup kitchen to serve the hundreds of Cuban exiles who were coming from Cuba in 1960. This was right, right post-revolution when they were rounding up a lot of single men who became part of the counter-revolution and were executing them without trial. So you had an influx of Cubans here. There was no support system at the time. They became homeless. And Little Brothers of the Good Shepherd were known for the, what they did, the good works they did in helping the homeless. Uh, and the head of the Little Brothers of the Good Shepherd said, you know, we'll go to Miami and we'll you know, we'll go and we'll open a soup kitchen, maybe a shelter, but we'll do it for anybody who's hungry and homeless, not just the Cubans. So we have actually been around for now 60 and a half years. Last August was our anniversary. And certainly because of COVID, uh, no graduations, no weddings, uh, and no anniversary celebrations for us. Um, and that's fine. We're very proud of what we do. We've been doing it for many years. Um, but today, certainly Camilla's house does not resemble that little soup kitchen shelter that was open, you know, in, in downtown Miami and eventually moved to where we are today. Um, tonight, we will serve a little over 1,700 men, women, and children in a Camilla's provided bed, either at our main facility, the one you see off of I-95, or through 10 other sites owned and operated by Camilla's house, and through amazing partnerships with landlords in the community who we work with to master lease or direct leases for clients who already live independently or already integrated in the community, not necessarily one of our project sites. We offer specialized programs that serve not just you know, homeless, homeless, but everything from veterans, we have several programs that serve veterans, unaccompanied homeless youth, those are folks 18 to 24, youth aging out of foster care, which find a large prevalence of foster care, of folks who are in foster care who become homeless as they're older, we have a specialized unit serving the only residential treatment program for adult victims of human trafficking. And we work closely with Miami Beach Police Department who participates actively in the Human Trafficking Task Force because regrettably, we know human trafficking happens uh, more frequently in areas where there's a lot of tourism. Um, and we are a DCF licensed and CARF accredited mental health and substance abuse treatment provider we provide those residential programs at service treatment programs at our main site. So while in fact, a lot of people think of Camilla's house as a shelter, emergency housing is what we call it, um, only about 17%, 1-7% of the clients we serve nightly are in fact in our emergency housing programs. The bulk of the clients that we serve on a regular, on a nightly basis are in our permanent supported housing. And like I said, that includes men, women, and children as we also operate large family programs. Uh, we also don't stop right there. We also serve hundreds more through a lot of 
non-residential programs that we provide and many occasions the only one. We operate the only day center in Miami-Dade County that allows street homeless people to walk in and take a shower and get clothing. In fact, we operate the only women's clothing and shower program in the entire county, allowing homeless women to come in and take a shower and get a clean set of clothing, hygiene products, whatever it is that they need. Our day center offers the only mail service. Mail, because there are people on the street that are going through processes, are looking for documentation, are trying to get back home, whatever it is, and they need a place to pick up mail and can't pay for a PO box. We provide mail service, the only place in the county where a homeless person can get free mail service. We offer identification that is used not just to access our services, but in many cases, homeless people use our identification to uh, cash check, they check cash in stores. Breakfast, the only hot breakfast in town. We provide lunch a couple days a week. We offer on-site legal services. We have a lot of clients that need some help with that. Um, we have an on-site clinic through our sister agency. And yes, we even have a dog kennel. So uh, we realize that when you're trying to bring in homeless people, you have to eliminate barriers for why they will or will not accept services. And for those of us that are parents of furry animals, we know we're not going to leave those guys behind. So we actually provide kennel services, have wonderful partnerships with retired veterans and vet techs in our community. Um, they're called Project Unleash, who come in on a monthly basis and take care of our, our furry residents who are here with their um, non-furry parents trying to get back on their feet. You know, I always tell folks that homelessness is really the end of the, of the process. I mean, there's people that might lose their housing first and then lose their job and whatever. And I will tell you, among the homeless that we serve when they come in, even in our day center, we know there are homeless people that actually go to work on a daily basis. And it probably would not surprise you that much of the work that those particular homeless people do um, is in construction. They will come in because we open our day center at 6.30 in the morning so they can take a shower and they can go clean to work. They cannot even stay for hot breakfast. Our hot breakfast is at 8.30 in the morning. And that's the reason we discovered we had this subpopulation of working homeless people, because we noticed that although we were allowing a certain number of people on site to go access uh, the campus and the services we provided, we had many more people showering than we had eating. And that just did not make sense. And we started asking, and that's what it was. People were coming in to take a shower so they could come to work. They could go to work. And they were walking in with their hard hats, with a reflective vest. Um, you know, getting ready to start a day where they were going to work all day and at night bed down somewhere in the community and then come to us the next morning for a chance to clean up um, and get back to work again. We do um, specialized outreach programs. We also run the county's homeless prevention helpline. So if someone is becoming homeless or being legally evicted, they call a 1-800 number. And when they press that number, that call is routed to us. And we figure out how we're going to best help them. Needless to say, we are kind of a little bit on pins and needles. We're going to see what happens in June with the lifting of the moratorium, eviction moratorium, um, where we anticipate there's some folks who are not going to qualify for other resources available right now. And as we know, the American Rescue Act has sent millions of dollars into communities like our communities here, our cities here, um, to help with uh, tenant, you know, tenants with payback and to help landlords with you know, covering some losses. Uh, but some folks just are not going to qualify for that. And they're going to qualify, they're going to be sent to us and work in a system in whatever is the appropriate next step for them. And not that it's going to be putting them in new housing. But there is one consistent, whether you're coming in because you've lost your housing or you're coming off the street or what have you, there's one thing that's consistent. If we, consistent. If we want to help you sustain, uh, obtain and sustain housing, you need to have income. And while there are some folks that are no doubt going to qualify for disability because they really cannot function in an environment, they cannot work physically for whatever reason, the bulk of the folks that we serve are not going to get disability, are not going to get subsidized housing, they need to work. There are the two biggest challenges to helping homeless individuals get back on their feet um, are housing, obviously, going out there and getting landlords willing to uh, rent to people that have spotty and difficult um, credit histories, you know, they've got criminal backgrounds, whatever it is, and of course, helping them get employment so they can sustain themselves. We have plenty of people that want to do that are looking for opportunities to go back into the workforce. And like I said, even folks that are working right now, we have licensed skilled people. We had a painter showed me his state licensing number who was staying at our shelter. Lots of folks have been impacted by COVID, but even before COVID, we know that lots of folks have been, have been impacted and come into our system because at the end of the day, after a series of issues, whether we wanna call them self-imposed or not, whatever we wanna say, because mental illness certainly is not, 
um, they have become homeless and are, are trying to get back on their feet. We are be very blessed. We have great partnerships. We have an on-site career source center. That's by the Workforce Development Boards of the state. They open career source centers all around the county for anyone who's looking for employment. We happen to have one physically in our building to serve the homeless clients that are in our programs, as well as homeless clients in, in programs nearby and the street homeless that come into our facility. Among the many things we have to work on is life skills training. Uh, we have to give, you know, help folks with core skills, with interpersonal skills. Uh, you cannot get angry the first time your boss tells you you messed up or whatever. And especially employment skills training. Um, how, to get, how to prepare for the interview, how to prepare a resume, how to um, ensure that once you're hired, you keep the job. You know, what are the appropriate employer-employee relationships after you get employed? Um, we are working on developing apprenticeships. So there's some opportunities through Miami-Dade um, College on apprenticeships in many different trades. And we even offer a supervised employment program that's run by the BID, the Downtown BID in Miami, the Downtown Development Authority, has what we call uh, DET, uh, the Downtown Enhancement Teams. And these are clients that we provide, 37 clients that are work ready, that we screen, that are out there every day, supervised, and they do the landscaping and all of the cleanup in downtown Miami. That program has been in place close to 20 years. Um, and it provides a great resume builder for our clients who move on to show, because they've been doing this for a while, uh, who move on to show that they can work, they can stick to it, they can show up every day um, and are hired away by Brightline and a whole bunch of other companies in the community. Um, so that is a really big component. And I know back in the day, many years ago, Commissioner, we used to have a program with the sanitation department at the beach where we where through another agency, homeless individuals were provided daily employment and they were assigned areas to do similar to what the downtown enhancement team does. Um, we do, uh, you know, we do a lot of job development efforts, you know, going out into the community, just like we go out and talk to landlords about giving our clients a chance and knowing that Camillus is standing behind that client. So if there's ever an issue, they can call us and we'll step in and help. We do the same thing with employers in the community. And I'm gonna give you an example about a week, we were introduced not too long ago through Paul um, with an organization called Azure Business Development. So Azure has an interesting business model, but one of the components that they do is they do post-construction cleanup. So the site's done. The next step is to really do the really good cleanup to be able to do it, you know, turn it over or to, you know, start selling units or whatever it is. Um, and we started having a conversation with them because they, like a lot of other industries, are having a real hard time hiring right now. But our clients want to work. So um, she told us, look, I need four people. They need, they need to be drug tested. They need to bring a hard hat. They need to bring, a, you know, they need to bring the shoes. They need to bring blah, blah, blah. Gave us a list of what we needed. Uh, this was a Thursday and we need them by Monday. And we were able to supply uh, four individuals, drug tested, clean with all the necessary equipment uh, so they could be there bright and early Monday morning and she needed them at 7.30 in the morning to begin that contract that that organization has. And they have multiple contracts across a bunch of other spreads, but in the construction world, that's what they do. They do prep, uh, post-construction prep before turnover. Um, but we, and we were able to do that. Our, you know, our goal in particular with, you know, providing employment programs and employment readiness programs is we've got to match the people. Our desire is never going to be to burn a bridge. We know how hard it is for some folks to take a risk, to take a chance on hiring someone who has perhaps a very spotty employment record for whatever reason, because they've, you know, spent some time in jail or prison, or they're coming out of a recovery program, what have you. Um, so we understand that there, you know, there's a chance. It's a chance you take. I mean, frankly, we employ people all the time. We are an employer. We are a nonprofit business. And um, I mean, I brought in a case manager once, lasted two weeks, went to lunch on a Wednesday and never came back. So, I mean, you always, you know, we kind of always, you know, sometimes roll the dice on some of the folks that we hire when we post it on Indeed. Um, and, you know, what we ask is for people to take a chance with our clients. And if there's ever an issue, they know that they have Camilla standing behind that client. They can call us and we can help resolve it. So, you know, we are looking at opportunities that, are, that seem equipped for the individuals that are transitioning back into the workplace. We have people with all kinds of skills, let me be clear. I mean, we get people who become homeless for many reasons. Um, I was working our day center one day and a very young guy, very young guy, mid twenties, maybe late twenties, um, clean cut, what have you. Um, he was a sous chef at Michael's Genuine and he had lost his job. And it was probably because, you know, you get, you know, meth is meth and whatever it is or whatever it is, we didn't get into a complex conversation. But that guy was employment ready, uh, freaking out because he was homeless at that time, had lost everything. And we do see that with frequency, people who are ready, willing, able uh, to move back 
into, you know, into employment um, and to see the opportunity in many cases of training. And our clients are willing to take a chance. We have graduated eight cohorts with Miami-Dade College to their hospitality institute uh, of individuals that have graduated with a kitchen, uh, kitchen prep, it's culinary arts, so they get like a cook license, but they get the food handling certification. 70, post pre-COVID, 75% of the graduates were being employed in area restaurants. Our last cohort had two clients placed at a cheesecake factory, one in Novacento and Brickell. Um, so, you know, we, you know, these, these folks are being well-trained. They're graduating with a, with, through a college course, basically, that's prepared for them, offered on site and gives them the hands, the, the hands-on training. And the same thing with construction trades. We did an original project many, about a year and a half ago with FIU, 10-week course. They did the first six weeks at our main facility and the last four weeks on site where they built an actual a simulation home uh, where everybody used their trade. So the people doing plumbing, did the plumbing in this house, it's a one bedroom home. Um, and it's the, the people doing you know, masonry, did masonry, carpentry, carpentry, et cetera. Um, we, you know, the, the distance is an issue. It's a tough town to get around. Homeless people have to rely on public transportation um, and having them go all the way to Tamiami campus was an issue. So we've, we have been looking for other partners and we're very blessed that the, the CRA, the Southeast Overtown Park West CRA, um, which we abut, um, was willing to fund a similar program there close to home actually on our campus. So we will, we are launching that already. And these are folks, again, that we're gonna make sure are ready, are ready to move on so that when they graduate, they're, they're able and ready to get hired. Um, you know, part of, you know, we, we were developing the, the, the budget of things that we need to support that program and our clients, can't afford to buy, you know, $75, you know, steel-toed boots. They can't afford, uh, you know, a lot of the accoutrements, right? Um, we sat down and we came up with this uh, hard hats for the homeless program and, you know, things that people can donate or buy and give so we can give to these clients to get them out there. And uh, among them are, you know, obviously bus passes, but part of our budget includes everything from, you know, drug testing, regular drug testing, um, to, you know, giving them t-shirts so they can go to work every day clean, enough t-shirts to go to work every day clean. Um, but these guys, you know, they're going to graduate of nothing else. They're going to have an OSHA certificate. We're going to offer a portion, some of these programs to even our currently housed homeless that are already working construction. It's not a surprise that, you know, construction pays well and we have clients trying to get back on their feet and they can start in sometimes a very low level entry level positions. So we do have quite a few folks that work in the trade. Um, and those folks we may, we, we're going to look at how do we help them in their trade? Do we want to ship them into an, a paid apprenticeship program? Do we want to shift them to, you know, get them their OSHA so they can more formally get employed if that's what they're going to pursue and continue to do? Um, and then clearly, you know, the, the biggest issue we have is once we get these people employment ready, we need to get them employed. We need partners that are willing to work with us um, to bring some folks in entry level, knowing that we, we're going to be there, making sure that client's showing up, following up, ensuring that they're, you know, they're going to be good employees because the last thing we can afford, the last thing we can afford once we convince someone to take a chance on a homeless person, which we think is a really, you know, the, the ROI is going to be awesome. But once we convince a, an organization, a business to take a chance on one of our clients, we cannot afford to burn that bridge. So we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that we send the right people who are, who are ready, who are capable, who meet the minimum requirements and expectations for a job, that we're going to do the ma appropriate matching to send the right people so that the experience is a positive one. We know we're not going to bat a thousand, but none of us bat a thousand when we hire people. We know that. Um, so what we're happy, what we're hoping is to give our people at least a chance to get to the plate, um, a chance to take a swing at the ball and get back in the swing of things, so, so to speak, um, so they can stabilize and be able to move into their own housing. We're going to do the rest of the heavy lifting, finding them a place, providing them the assistance to move in, but we need to find them the means for them to sustain themselves once they move in. And obviously employment is key. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, Paul, I don't know if I missed anything. But... Well, just on this construction program that we're starting on the 24th of May with the Southeast Overtown. Overtown. I'm getting an echo, sorry. Getting an echo, sorry. Not sure why. Um, it's a 14 work week course. It's gonna highlight, it's gonna emphasize electrical carpentry. You'll end up with an OSHA 30. Uh, they'll also get training in finance, you know, basic, how to keep my books, how to pay my bills, things of that nature, social skills, job placing, placement, and a housing component. Um, 
supplies, books. Camillus will take the first seven weeks of the 14 weeks on site training, and then there'll be a combination of books and uh, at the OPEC in Overtown for hands on training. Uh, no cost to us. And, and, and for those that are participating, they're actually going to be, be given a stipend of $160 per week per person for the 14 weeks. Great incentive. Um, and if it goes well, we're going to evaluate after the first seven weeks. And if the first seven weeks go well, we'll start enrollment for the next 14 weeks, which will also be um, sponsored by the Southeast Overtown CRA. So this is a great opportunity. Um, and again, it's no cost to Camilla's house, but it provides a great benefit. And then we're going to try to put them out there in the workforce. So without even a formal career orientation, I think just by posting a sign, I don't know if it's the other day, we've had 21 people of interest so far. We can only do 15 max per course. So, uh, you know, we're hoping this is a, is a game changer, you know, to get people out there and get them employed. And we know what the living wage is. We know it's 22 or plus dollars per hour. And uh, it's hard to find that kind of work right now. And we know the construction industry is booming. And, you know, we know that there's a, a, a very strong demand for the labor. So that's, that's what I have on that. And uh, we're excited about this. And uh, we got great partner in, in, uh, in who we're working with. We're very committed to trying to help the homeless in the area. So well, that's, that's it. So I just wanted to add, you know, our, when, when we did this wonderful partnership with FIU, which, by the way, was a grant. A Lennar grant that was given to FIU to do that construction trades program. Um, it, they, ha they, they targeted a little over 50 people. They started with a higher number of people. It, was, it wasn't just homeless people, it was people in the community. It was actually folks from the community were highly represented in that cohort. And the number one student, the top student, the one who spoke at their graduation was actually a graduate of Camilla's house from our human trafficking program, a female. Uh, so we are exceedingly proud uh, Devin, um, I was going to take her to Washington, D.C. last year as we were invited to a panel on human trafficking. She's really an example of given the, you know, given the proper support and resources, people, you know, the people that we work with, you know, that, that are capable uh, are, are going to rise to the top and try to do the best. And because they're, they're very motivated, they're incentivized to do that. And we're going to help them do whatever else they need and help them with the housing, whatever, other, anything else they need. But, you know, we cannot help them if they, if they don't have employment and they don't qualify for any kind of rent subsidy and we're not section eight. So they have to be severely disabled to qualify for subsidized housing. Um, then, you know, they, they're gonna need assistance moving out there. And look, we're being creative too. We're doing roommate programs now. There's like, you know, college roommates now, you know, we're having to do roommate matching because we realize, you know, housing is what housing is in Miami Dade. Um, and, you know, we folks cannot afford to live on their own many times. So we're having to uh, do adult roommate matching now uh, to make sure that people can afford a safe, decent place to live while they go out and work, earn a living, however it is they have to earn a living every day in Miami-Dade County. Um, so, uh, you know, what can you do to help? I think I saw something in the chat room. Yes, you know, there are many opportunities, I'm sure, among construction, real estate, uh, and, and development in the community where you can use, you know, folks either with semi-skilled or, or, or low-skilled labor, where you might be able to use folks that already do have experience or that we can get OSHA certified. So they come to you with a little bit more than the guy you're bringing in off the street and hopefully not picking up in front of Home Depot or something, but that you can actually get them on, on, your, on your, you know, your work site and take less risk because they, they already know the safety requirements, whether it's the OSHA 30 or there's a shorter OSHA 10, um, you know, get them in a position where they could be willing to do that. We're willing to discuss apprenticeships. We're willing to discuss, you know, supervised employment opportunities, like what we used to do on the beach and sanitation, like what happens in the downtown enhancement team, where we send in a team, but they're supervised by uh, someone we provide so that the assignment is given. It's almost like a staffing service. The assignment is given, it's taken care of. Um, we cover the workman's comp, not you, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so um, love to talk about all those opportunities. Talk about all those opportunities. Uh, can you hear me? I have a question. Can I ask? Yeah. yeah. Hello? Hello? Okay. I just want to make sure I'm driving. So, <laughs> um, so one of the things I do is uh, leadership, soft skills, job performance, and accountability training. And what I was thinking um, is that one of my corporate clients, you know, they require about, uh, and they're in the valley parking, valley attendant uh, business, and they require about 10 candidates a week. So I don't know if there's a possibility to provide for me to provide the training that could be paid for by them. And then, 
you know, they get the candidates that they're looking that are properly trained and groomed and prepared for the job that they need. And is that something that can be explored? Absolutely. I'm so glad Absolutely. You- I'm so glad you uh, for example, uh, we, for example, we uh, by a uh, by a uh, we would think it'd be easy to hire we think it'd be easy to hire security guards. Security guards. Um, but in fact, what ends up what happening is, is what ends up happening is apparently a need for apparently a need for security guards. So we have a company. So we have a company. They're willing to come on campus. They're willing to come on campus. Our training and our training. So right, yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. That they might be having me come in and train and get them prepared. And then, you know, they require about 10 a week. So maybe that's something we can explore. I would love to discuss that further. I would love to discuss that further with you. Yeah. So I put the information in the chat. If we can connect, that would be awesome. Will do. Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you very much. Um, Jerry has his hand up. Your, your uh, speaker's off, Jerry. Your mic is off. Thank you. Uh, Hilde, we're getting an echo on everything you say. It's repeating, so try and see if you can make an adjustment. But um, I wanted to see if uh, donation of, of high quality uh, clothing would be of value to you for helping to you know, prepare people to go out on the interviews. Uh, is that something? I have a... Uh, I have a member of my BNI chapter who is a, a clothier for uh, custom uh, clothing for Tom James Custom Clothing, and he contacted me not long ago saying, "Hey, a lot of his clients, you know, want to give back, you know, some, you know, clothing they're no longer using. It's still in good shape. Uh, so I've been trying to look at where can we plug that in. Is that if I made a connection to you? Is that something you'd be interested in?" Absolutely, Commissioner. We run, as I mentioned, a men's and women's clothing room, and that is used by the clients in our program. So we have about 400 clients who live in our main facility between emergency housing and those coming out of residential treatment, including uh, a floor of veterans. And, you know, while we're moving people into construction trade, so we need all kinds of clothing. We know there are a lot of positions in hospitality that are going to be reopening that they're having a really hard time filling. And those positions sometimes are front of house or they're seen in the front. So we do need our clients to dress nicely. So, you know, we work, uh, if we, if there is something we receive that we find too much of, we are, we're, we're one of those organizations that we will share the wealth. So, you know, if we receive too much of that. We work with Suda for Success, so we will provide it to Suda for Success and vice versa. They get a whole shipload of jeans. They don't need as many. They'll give us jeans. So um, there's there's always a need for that commission. We have to send clients out for interviews constantly. Um, so there's always a need for good clothing. Uh, you know, and as long as it's in decent, you know, in good shape, something right, that you know can be worn so again. One, one, follow one follow up question, yeah. Hilda. Can you put your uh, email in the chat? And I'm going to connect you to Giacomo Kalani, uh, you know, directly to yourself or whomever you want, you know, us to connect to. The other, the other comment, and even though we're here really focusing on the training and, and which is so critical to get you know, people employed, I, I think it also should just spend a minute, if you, if you don't mind, uh, you talked about the uh, fact that you only have on any given night, maybe 10 available beds, but I know that you know, when there's a storm, and we're just now heading into hurricane season, when there's a storm pending, uh, people go out into their various communities and folks that don't normally want to accept the shelter better are told, listen, this is really gonna be bad. You need to get off the street. How do you handle that? And, and how, how big is that population? So, uh, you know, the homeless counts are done twice a year, but I will tell you what happened with Irma, for example. The state, the, the, uh, the county declared um, an activation, our emergency management activation, the Wednesday before they were anticipating Irma to head on a Friday. And if some of you that were around may remember, it did not hit till Sunday. So they asked organizations like Camillus to open our doors and accept street homeless individuals. We have, like I said, a nightly population of almost 400 people who live in our main campus. So um, during Irma, we took in 265 additional street homeless individuals. Um, it gets a little complicated because obviously we prepare me- three meals a day. We do about a thousand meals daily in our in our dining hall. We prepare all of our own meals, with the exception of Little Caesars, who will be coming in today and donating pizzas to our clients. 
but we basically prepare every meal every day between 15 to 17,000 meals a month, depending on what's happening. And so those were, these are periods of extreme stress for homeless facilities because we take in as many clients as are willing to come in and they're brought in by outreach teams. Some of them walk up to our gate and we take them in. It's not the model that exists on a day-to-day -day basis in Miami. It's the only time homeless shelters take walk-in clients into their housing. But we, we realize it's gonna be much safer for them to be inside. And we do, we accommodate, we put out cots and mats. And then we have a core of volunteers that basically makes, uh, coming into the storm in this case, made 1500 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Cause we knew at some point our dining hall was gonna to have to shut down and we were gonna to have to feed people wherever they were being housed for the moment. Uh, but yes, over the course of five days, we took in 265 additional people. And just for, for uh, a sense of what that means, we did not get reimbursed by that from FEMA until March of last year. Irma was in September of 2017. We got reimbursed in March of 2020. And I am convinced the only reason we got reimbursed two and a half, three years later is because they were trying to wipe the slate in preparation of a slew of COVID uh, FEMA claims and they wanted to get all that Irma stuff out of the way. So, you know, from a homeless agency, we are a nonprofit agency. Yeah, we have a big ginormous building that costs a lot of money to run. We're very blessed to have a great campus to provide those services to our clients. But at the end of the day, we're a nonprofit agency. I mean, I can't begin to tell you what out of pocket we've had to expend relating to COVID in the last 14 months. Um, that has been another insane moment for us because, you know, we are a congregate living facility. We cannot afford people to get sick. And, and as an aside, in the 14 months since COVID, so since we launched our COVID response plan, March 1st of last year, we have only had 65 clients. We have served thousands of people we've only had 65 positive cases. We have not had a positive case on our campus since February 16th. So, um, you know, there is a lot of work that is done when you're trying to take care of people and make sure um, that they are staying safe and healthy. And, uh, you know, but again, we're very blessed with partners in the community to make it so much simpler that, are, that will work with us, give our, our clients a chance, you know, take a look at us when they're looking at, uh, they've got a building, they might have one apartment they're willing to provide to a homeless client and you know knowing that we're going to stand behind that client or stand behind anything that might happen um, in case there's a need to to deal with something with that tenant so um, you know be happy to you know to send information about that as well um, you know Miami Beach is a little bit more of a pricier market but we do know there are hosp a lot of folks in hospitality live on the beach I happen to uh, know and understand that um, there's the the, the that the uh, disparity income disparity in Miami Beach can be kind of extreme sometimes and you do need people that can work in all industries um and that's you know our goal is to be able to prepare people to do that valerie you had your hand up well before anything else hilda this and and, and paul this was an amazing presentation it was a lot of information and uh, I, I take my head off for you guys uh, for everything that you do and, and so many other services that you do i wanted to ask you about the lazarus project because you know a lot of the homeless uh, for the people that doesn't know the lazarus project is a project that medicates the mentally ill and is run by camilo's house and it's an amazing project because if you're mentally ill you can't make a rational decision of going to work or getting off the streets or accepting any kind of services um is there anything that we can help you? Because I understand that now the, the contract, the ball is in your, uh, is in your park. Is there any, anything that either myself or the chamber can do to help expedite that? We can pass that to Javon to expedite. <laughs> so um, yeah, Lazarus Project, we do run specialized outreach programs. Um, as a matter of fact, we only specialize mental health treatment programs on the street. And so as Valerie said, you know, the reality is we have some severely mentally ill people that are not capable of having a conversation about coming in on housing. They're mentally not capable of having that conversation. No cognitive ability because of their mental illness. The program is focused only on those. And we literally go out on the street and engage them. It's a long and complicated process sometimes. But we engage them to the point where we have a psychiatric nurse practitioner on the team that eventually assesses them and prescribes medication, which we then go out on the street seven days a week to administer because we do know that with psychiatric meds, the consistency of taking the medication will, will help people get stabilized. And then at the point they're stable, we can have a conversation about housing. It's been a very successful program. We did a mini version of that on the beach. It wasn't as fully staffed as our main program. Um, many challenges with that as a result because it wasn't as fully staffed as our main program. And so Valerie, I want you to know that we continue to provide PATH and Lazarus resources on the beach, even though it's not currently being funded because we know there are chronic homeless individuals on the beach that need that assistance.
And the beach historically has had the second highest concentration of chronically homeless people in all of Miami-Dade County. Um, and I used to tell folks all the time, it would not be surprising because if I hate to say this, but if I was going to be homeless, I think I'd want to be homeless on Miami Beach. You can you know, you have public restrooms, you have showers, you can lay down on the beach and you know people don't know who you are. Um, but the bottom line is you do have a high concentration of chronic homeless and chronicity as defined by the federal government means they've been homeless for more than a year, have had multiple episodes of homelessness in the last three years. And you see that, you see the same, in some cases in Miami Beach, or this, this percentage of folks, there are the same folks that are there over and over again. I can tell you, you know, one lady in particular, one young lady in particular, who is uh, well-known by a lot of the folks on the beach and she's well-known by us. She has been our Lazarus client, has come in and out of housing and we continue to do whatever we can. You know, our country is a country of laws and our laws say that you cannot force people to take medication. Uh, so the best you can do is use all the tools in your toolbox. And we have incredibly trained and skilled clinicians and psychiatrists and psychologists that go out there on the street, not in a fancy office, but on the street and convince these folks um, that they should consider being medicated, convince them to get medicated, convince them to take their meds regularly so that we can uh, get them into housing and then support them while they're housed. We can't drop them while they're housed or else they'll go back on the street. So we surround them with services even once they get housed. So the Lazarus Project, you know, is a little, uh, we're taking a look at the a request that's being done with the level of funding that's being made available. It just seems like it's not the best use of the resource, to be honest with you, Valerie. Um, and there might be a better use of that resource. Uh, we work with Miami Beach Police, who, you know, does as you know, Marchman. Uh, we went back to South, to Thriving Minds, a funder of behavioral health services, and asked them to fund Marchman beds. So when clients placed by your, by your police department, in detox through Marchman, need a place to go. Detox is only detox. They got to go to treatment when they're done. And you know, for a homeless person, they're going to be best served in an organization that knows how to deal with homeless individuals and the very specific issues of homeless individuals. Um, you know, if my 30-year-old nephew needed to go into substance abuse treatment, he can go into a bunch of facilities in the community and do amazing jobs of substance abuse treatment. But when he's done, he's going to go to a house. He's going to go either to his own apartment or go live with his mom again. Um, homeless people are, are not in that position. So we provide residential treatment and we know that at the end of that cycle, once they reach sobriety, that we need to place them into housing and we have the skills to do that. So, you know, I think the idea is, you know, what is the best use of the city's money? I may not work there anymore, but I appreciate the fact that I'm a taxpayer in my city and I want to make sure that the resource is best used. And right now under the format that's being proposed for Lazarus, if we can continue to provide some support, you know, maybe maybe those funds can be used in a different way to support what's happening at the beach with the homeless. I was not aware that you guys were still medicating our homeless here in Miami Beach. So we that's have, fantastic. Yeah. That's, I had no idea. Thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. So what you're saying is that the, the contract for the Lazarus project will not be renewed? Um, unless, you know, we're looking at whether we can modify just the version that what we received has a component that we just don't know um, that with the funding and the resources that we'd be able to accomplish everything if this ad additional expectation is included. It's just uh, it's a really intense new requirement. And again, we just don't know if that's the best use. If we can continue to support the beach, because not only do we have Lazarus, we have PATH. We send our PATH program out there on a regular basis as well, which is also for the mentally ill, um, you know, to Mount yeah, Sinai. For every Thursday, yeah. So if we can continue to provide support to the beach and we're committed to it, you know, we're you know, we're a county resource. We look at it as our a county resource. We want to serve the cities that have a homeless concentration and Miami Beach certainly does. Uh, so we'll continue to do that. Um, yes, would it be ideal if you had your own dedicated team? That would be fantastic. But, you know, uh, we're working through it. We're, we'll see where we end up. But, you know, I know that they asked us recently again to, to, to reach back to them and we're looking at it again and see if there's something that makes sense. But I think it has to make sense for the city, the city too. You want to be able to, you know, make sure that your dollars are being well spent and that you're getting a, uh, a return on that investment. And um, we don't want to, you know, we do not into over promising. We, you know, we're not one of those nonprofits. Yeah, yeah, give us the money and then we can't deliver. That's just, you know, we want to be able to provide the services and if we can still continue to serve somehow and maybe come up with a different approach for that, the use of those funds that are better serve the city and more importantly, the homeless residents of the city, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll make that recommendation. Instead. So uh, we knew there'd be a ton of questions and we're quickly running out of time. We have um, three more. We've got Gloria, Michael and Javon. And we're gonna to have to wrap it up after that. So if you guys could go ahead. Good morning, Hilda. How you doing? Gloria Fonseca from Fonsis LLC. We had met in uh, other meetings, uh, Global Innovative Foundation, when you were presenting Camilo's house for the human trafficking survivors and see how we can collaborate. 
Yep. Um, I am the owner of Fonsi LLC. We provide services for painting and carpentry. And uh, myself, I am a survivor of domestic violence and I work with uh, family court services and also with dependency court for 15 years. And I do have experience and I feel love in my heart. <laughs> all the victims and, and survivors. That's why I developed myself in my company, a training program where we are training women survivors of domestic violence or human trafficking. And I am myself, um, you know, certified with OSHA and all of that. And the uh, curriculum that I developed, I want to offer to you and a volunteer at Camilo House because it's hard now to see the, you know, there are many homeless, many people that are in shelter that they want to work and they have, you know, the possibility, they just need some, you know, support. And there are many organizations, but we are not connected. And that's why we are doing this. And I am very thankful with the chamber, Miami Beach Chambers of Commerce, very thankful with the and the environment to, to participate and to belong because you guys have, tremendous, tremendous leadership and the, everything that you guys are doing are really benefiting the, the community. So um, Hilda, my email and I do have yours and I will be contacting you because I really want to, to put together our efforts and I need, you know, employees and I am more than willing because I know where the people is really, where the shoes are really tying. And, and when you know that you are more available and more quickly to help. So, um, Thank you for everything that you guys do. Uh, we continue here, Fonsi LLC, Gloria Fonseca. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Um, good morning, Mine's just a quick comment. Um, you know, Paul and I met in 2013, my first year as chair of the chamber, and I've developed a great relationship. And I, I had lunch with Paul a couple of weeks ago, and, and Paul really educated me to a lot of the stuff that Hilda and him spoke about. And, and probably most of the public don't realize the extent of what Camila's House does. And, I, and to be honest with you, I never did. Uh, it's amazing what you all do. Um, you know, Paul had been involved for a while and it was a big choice and decision of his to step up as chair, as we all know, when you chair an organization. You know, I would say what Paul's doing as chair of Camila's House uh, as to, you know, us chairing the chamber is, 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 is a little bit of a higher level. A lot of responsibility is passionate, but also, you know, what's evident is the relationship Paul has with Hilda. You know, when you chair an organization and you have a CEO, you got to work hand in hand. And uh, Paul, I know you probably speak to Hilda more often than you do with your wife. Like I said, when I was chair of the chamber with Jerry, I very rarely spoke to my wife. But I spoke to Jerry 10 times a day. So just kudos to, to, to both of you for what you're doing and Paul for stepping up and taking a leadership role. Uh, the chamber's proud of you. Thanks. But, you know, it's easy, Mike, because the staff, the leadership and staff, Camillus, I, I, like I said earlier, I'd put them up against anybody, any business, anybody. The infrastructure that's in place there is incredible. As a business owner, I, I can I recognize that, or as a past business owner. So uh, you know we're also in a build. We also have the ability right now. And I don't want to say this because it will kill me, but we can expand our services. We can outreach without too much effort because of the phenomenal infrastructure that you know that she's put in place here. So thank you. Right, last question, Javon. Uh, thanks again for joining us. This has been very enlightening. Um, Hilda, you're a wealth of knowledge and, and you're doing amazing work there. Uh, Paul, thanks for you know loaning your guys' time this morning. Um, you know, Paul, you just mentioned you guys are up for expansion. And my question was regarding the construction uh, program. You know, it, it seems a little limited. You, you mentioned, I think, 16 participants at a time. Um, you know, what's the biggest constraint there in terms of the capacity and, and what's the key to expanding that, whether it's adding more people per training session or adding more training sessions, like what would be needed? What, what do you guys need in order to expand that? I, feel like I can let you answer that, Hilda, but go ahead. Well, I imagine, I think from a CRA's perspective, it, I think that that course because of the intensity of the training that's involved, I think, you know, that's a little bit of a hefty price tag. So, um, you know, the number I, you know, you know, you know, what's really sad when we first started our, let me give you an example, our culinary arts programs, we were averaging about 15 clients. We always hire, you know, we always have to, you know, recruit more because you got some natural attrition. Um, then the, the college came back to us and said, because of COVID, we can't do more than eight. We've always had more demand for that program, but they, you know, you need to have smaller classes. We used to do the afternoon sessions in our dining hall. I mean, we prepare a lot of meals and we, so we have a professional kitchen. We, they had to stop doing that and they go to Miami Dade College once a week. So, 
you know, COVID has had a little bit of an impact. I don't know if 15 is their sweet spot when we spoke to them. You know, they've run this program before for community members, for, you know, uh, you know, low-income individuals in their community, and they seem to find the 15 is the sweet spot because, remember, they do apprenticeships and they move them in. They do, you know, they do shadowing. Uh, this program includes a stipend. So, you know, the price tag is a little bit of a lift um for for so i don't know if it's just that the number of people you know is tied to whatever the budget is um but our hope is that you know, we think it's going to be because we thought we've seen it before that we'll be able to do a second and third and continue doing cohorts and doing it in some specialized areas so this one may for example have more of an emphasis on carpentry but if the need out there is ele you know, as electricians then we're you know i think they'll shift to do electrical they gave us a set they gave us the full literally like 10 different curriculums tied to doing, or I mean, maybe it was a time with like seven different um, particular trades. So, you know, whatever the community needs, let me give you an example. The hotel industry, we're very blessed because we have Julie Grimes from the Bentley Hilton on Miami Beach is on our board. And so, and we had um, the, the GM from the Fountain Blue on our board, you know, the hospitality industry is what it is. Of course, regrettably, a very impacted industry during COVID. Um, so she came to us and she said, you know, we're having a heck of a time hiring hotel maintenance workers. We just can't get them. You know, we just can't get enough people who can come in with a broad enough experience so they can not only go and respond to that leaky faucet complaint, but if the air conditioner is making a noise or whatever it is. So we worked with Miami D College to put together a curriculum, a I think it was a six or seven week course to produce hotel maintenance workers to address a need in the hospitality industry. Regrettably, right when we were about to start recruiting, COVID hit. So they decided to just stick with the, we were gonna do that as our second program. We're doing culinary arts already with the college. But that's the case that if the construction industry comes to us and says, listen, we are just having a heck of a time uh, with, you know, doing, with getting plumbers or getting whatever, then that's just the conversation we will have with our partners at the SCOPW to produce what the industry needs. There is no point, you know, in producing folks that, you know, are gonna go through a 10 week course and, and you know, I don't think it's going to happen very often in construction, but they're going to have a difficult time getting that. Again, same thing happened with security. They cannot hire anyone. They're willing to come in and train. We're going to pay for the state license, the $93 per person to get certified. But, you know, they, the in industries are saying, gosh, we need help doing that. We, we don't know how to train people to be a security guard, but they do. We're having somebody come in and, te and teach uh, home care, home health aides. They were, there's a big need for home health aides. So, you know, if the industry, you can help us plan better, tell us, what is it that you need there? What is it that, that you're seeing on your job sites that, that your folks may be having a hard time, your GCs and your subs are having a really hard time identifying people, not only that they're qualified, but that they're interested in coming in and showing up every day to earn a really good, decent living that's gonna help them uh, live independently in the community. Yeah. Yvonne, I know we're out of time, but um, real quick, we can run parallel programs too. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, Miami World Center is coming in and they're doing some basic OSHA training and then they'll, they'll move they'll move the clients straight, straight on to job sites. And so for on the job training, you know, more lower level, less formalized training. So we can run parallel programs. We've gotten such demand from this program that we can't, you know, we can't accommodate everybody that's looking, so. Yeah, uh, Paul, we'll have to have some follow on conversations uh, from this. This was really, really awesome. Hill done, Paul, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the opportunity, yeah. appreciate yeah. it. It was really eye-opening, it was inspirational, it was informational, I, I don't think, it, um, very many of us had any idea um, the scope and size of the of the uh, and the complexity of the operation you guys have over there. Really well, like I said, Dade County has the best of the business in Hilda. That's just a fact. She won't look. She's she's humble, so she's shaking her head. But that's a fact. I'll I'll, I'll tell you that for sure. And there's more things on the horizon for Camilla's house that we're not we can't speak about yet. But we're hoping we're hoping to um, be able to showcase that to Miami Dade County pretty soon. Yeah. Kudos to both of you for everything you're doing for the community. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so uh, that's going to uh, be a wrap for today. Uh, there's the chamber chat with Mayor Gelber that just started. If any of you are interested in joining, um, I want to I make a quick thank you to, to Javon and Jerry and Robin, uh, Danny, Alicia, everybody else who's involved in putting these things together. Uh, thank you very much. Hope everybody has a great and wonderful day. We'll see. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now.